Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I'd like to congratulate the conveners of this conference for, for um, convening the conference on, a, on an extremely important subject and sincerely regret my inability to be here with you this afternoon. This conference is about um, security in, a, in health and a certain specific aspect of health security. Uh, but before we go on to that, I think it's important to appreciate that the contemporary understanding of security today scopes beyond um, wars and, and human rights abuses and genocide to a people-centered view of security uh, along the lines of the norms that have been coined by the, by the UNDP and the Commission on Human Security. This is a holistic concept which includes water, food, energy, environment and health security and indeed in overpopulated countries such as the one that I come from, demographic security is a very important part of such security considerations. There are three aspects of health security which are extremely important. One of them is ensuring financial risk protection and financial security for health. The second is healthcare security and the subject under consideration and within the remit of today's discussion is epidemiological security. Within the scope of epidemiological security, uh, we tend to address public health emergencies of national and international concern, emerging and re-emerging infections, and biological or chemical emergencies, whether they're accidental or terrorism related. Whilst I speak for a few minutes about epidemiological health security, uh, I'd like to touch upon two aspects. I'd like to talk about uh, global and domestic information systems and then very briefly, I'd like to talk about the broader health systems issues and constraints, which are an impediment to ensuring epidemiological security within the ambit of health. With reference to a global and domestic information systems, I think it's important to appreciate and understand right at the very outset that domestic information systems within the health sector comprise a plethora of different arrangements. So if you look at a country context, uh, there is surveillance happening in different streams, there's vital registration, there's infectious disease surveillance, which is fragmented into different pockets because of the manner in which vertical public health programs have been initialized in the developing countries. There is a surveillance of chronic disease risk factors in, uh, as part of surveys, then there is surveillance which has been conducted in, um, in registries Apart from the surveillance activities of a uh, domestic health information system, there are management information systems which are linked to uh, health facilities. There are periodic surveys which are conducted by different agencies in different cycles. They are institutionalized by different development agencies. So the World Bank has its social and living standards measurement survey. The UNICEF tends to support the multiple indicator cluster surveys. Um, the, U the USAID, a bilateral agency, promotes the um, uh, demographic health surveys in many developing countries. And then outside of these health information systems are a number of research activities, academic research activities, um, which have to do with epidemiological research, which have to do with health systems and policy research and clinical trial and so on and so forth. So within this diverse space of health information systems, there are a number of gaps in each area. And I'd like to focus on gaps that are relevant to the subject under consideration today. First, the first gap, which I think is of critical importance, is the fragmentation of infectious disease surveillance systems and the lack of integration. Then there are attributes of infectious disease surveillance um, which have not been honed for outbreak and emergency situations. So countries may have um, capacity to conduct active surveillance visits at health facilities. They may have uh, the infrastructure to collect specimens from laboratories and to transport and conduct testings. They may have functioning channels of data reporting and analysis and dissemination. Uh, and they may have defined indicators to measure surveillance uh, quality. Uh, and they may have infrastructure for training and capacity building. But as I said earlier, they may not be honed for outbreak and emergency situations. And all these capacities may remain fragmented within individual disease domains. And this, to my mind, is one of the core um, impediments and country constraints that needs to be addressed through consolidated capacity building efforts um, 
supported by international uh, agencies. Secondly, and uh, with reference to domestic information systems, uh, there is, of course, a gap in capacity to confirm clinically diagnosed cases of reportable diseases because of gaps in the public health laboratory network within countries and many developing countries of Asia. Um, there are, of course, inabilities to tap data from the private sector. Uh, for instance, the country that I come from has a large and vibrant private sector with, with, uh, with very little linkages with information system reporting. Then again, citing an example from my own country in terms, of a health, in terms of a health information system constraint, there's absence of a legal system to mandate notification of priority diseases, and my sense is that it may, may similarly be the case with many other developing countries of Asia. Uh, again, from my own country, there's lack of a regulatory framework for laboratory practice. There's absence of legal requirements to report death per se and report cause of death um, in death certificates using the ICD uh, classification for coding um, and it may similarly be the case for many other developing countries for Asia. But by far the most important constraint with reference to the subject under consideration is the absence of apex institutional arrangements to collate, consolidate, analyze, interpret and report data and information. Um, so there are a number of ad hoc overlapping and standalone data systems and then many donor-driven data activities, but the apex arrangement to collate and consolidate them and then uh, analyze and try and make triangulations and report data and communicate them to the right agencies in a timely manner uh, is an area where there are significant gaps. Um, to add to these, um, there are gaps in mechanisms to communicate data. Um, and again, along the lines of the constraints that we are talking about, uh, and citing an example from my own country, there's lack of uniform standards for ensuring quality in data reporting. Um, very importantly, there are poor linkages with the country's disaster management system. So during the earthquake, these information systems um, had, had to be um, structured de novo in terms of the linkages with the country disaster management system. And I'm here referring to an earthquake that happened in Pakistan in 2005, which claimed more than 80,000 lives. Um, again, our experience from uh, this particular incident and from the subsequent outbreaks of avian flu um, gave us the sense that there were inappropriate intersectoral linkages for data sharing across sectors particularly foreign affairs channels, transport, home affairs, and the, uh, and the agriculture sector. Um, the, the country, our country, and I'm sure many other countries, uh, therefore have limited capacity to comply with international health regulations of 2005 of the World Health Organization. Um, and the country does not make adequate use of global surveillance norms and capacity building tools. Uh, most importantly to my mind, uh, technology has not been strategically leveraged to enhance connectivity without Pakistan's data systems, uh, despite the existence of an excellent uh, telecommunications infrastructure. And my sense is that this may be the case in many other developing countries of Asia as well. However, most importantly and critically, um, is a culture of decision making which is based on conventional person in personal interests and act and anecdotal evidence uh, and or, or political expediency as opposed to evidence. And I think this is a core institutional attribute and governance which needs to be shaped um, for health security and, and for broader social sector outcomes in many countries of Asia and, in, and indeed in my country. So what quick, very quickly can be the mitigates to the domestic constraints in health information systems as they relate to the subject under consideration uh, in today's conference. Uh, and I think it's critical to as establish and to um, make investments in establishing an APEX institutional arrangement to strengthen data and information norms uh, and to create the right and appropriate intersectoral linkages, both domestically, uh, regionally and globally to ensure that data is shared and disseminated in a timely and, most importantly, in a transparent manner. Um, then, uh, secondly, I think it's important to integrate the piecemeal surveillance activities 
and develop comprehensive public health surveillance systems consisting of peripheral data collection arms linked to the central system, strategically leveraging technology. Um, in countries where there are no legal systems to mandate notification of priority diseases, the need to do so becomes an imperative, uh, as is the need to regulate laboratory practice. And then, of course, I have uh, consistently made the point about the strategic use of technology uh, in data systems, which to my mind is an extremely important consideration in our countries. Global agencies can help domestic health information system consolidating uh, by giving technical expertise in all respects, including ensuring transparency. Um, they can step up the global alert and response network uh, and assist in addressing fragmentation at a normative level, um, particularly with respect to the role of various international agencies. Um, they can bring, uh, they can build capacity in a very targeted manner to step up the capacity of countries to implement the international health regulations. Um, they can, of course, uh, help by augmenting domestic and technical human resource capabilities within epidemic investigation cells and, more broadly, assist countries to reconfigure their capacity to conduct locally suited research that can um, enable them to strengthen their information systems and enable disease security in the larger interest of their populations. Um, when I began my talk, I said that domestic and global information systems is one piece that needs to be strengthened in order to move towards the broader goal of ensuring um, epidemiological security. Uh, but I think this will not be achieved unless the broader health systems constraints and issues within the remit of the political economy of a country are addressed. And I think in line with this, uh, it's very critical to take a very quick snapshot of how health systems are performing in countries of Asia. Barring many countries who um, have performed extremely well in the health sector, um, there are many others where health systems performance assessment indicates poor performance. Um, there are three indicators that we use for health systems performance assessment. One of them is Fairness, of fairness in financing, the other is achieving equity in health outcomes, and the third is responsiveness. And if you gauge the performance of many Asian countries, many developing Asian countries by this measure, you will see that they have fared very poorly. If you have access to my slides at this point, and if they are being shown concurrently in, in tandem with this video, you will be able to see a number of slides that, that can be projected on the screen from my country, which can show you how poorly the country performs with respect to all these three uh, health systems endpoints. And unfortunately, the time uh, limit will not allow me to go into the details of that. I have recently authored a publication by the name of Choked Pipes Reforming Pakistan's Mixed Health System, which gives a, a consolidated roadmap for addressing these systemic issues. The basis for the reform agenda that has been articulated in this book has actually uh, been published in a publication uh, which has come out in the WHO Bulletin in its January issues. The um, publication describes the mixed health system syndrome, uh, a syndrome, a phenomena in which there are systemic constraints in a health system where public provision of services coexists with market provision of services and where a triad of determinants systemically undermines the quality and equity outcomes of a health system. Um, and I've described how poor resourcing of a public system interacts with an unregulated role of a, the private sector in the presence of lack of tr overall transparency and governance. Uh, and I hope that um, the organizers will be able to put up that slide to allow you to see how the three interact together to systemically undermine the quality and equity objectives of a health system. In the book entitled Choke Pipes, 
I have articulated um, a reform agenda. The reform agenda has three components. One of them is um, reform of overall governance. Uh, I'm strongly of the opinion that unless there's macroeconomic reform that enables growth, pro-poor growth, which accrues benefits to populations, um, unless there is broader-based fiscal reform that increase the fiscal space for, for health allocations, unless there's overall reform of governance to enable efficiency uh, and transparency, uh, health systems reform in isolation will have very little impact. And therefore, the first stem of re reform for a mixed health system that I advocate for centers on reform of overall governance. And my sense is that although this reform agenda has been articulated for Pakistan, it is very relevant to the other countries, uh, to the other developing countries uh, of Asia. Uh, the, the, the second stem of reform um, centers of so on social sector reform uh, where, where many areas have been outlined and the third area of, uh, of reform uh, relates to reform of health systems per se where five areas of focus have been identified and again the slides uh, which I hope will be circulated to you uh, outline this uh, in, in bullet points. Um, I have attempted to um, outline certain steps for policy reforms, for policy reform in mixed health systems. I have drawn upon an analysis of, um, of, of legislative norms within the country to outline how that policy reform could be supported by a legislative agenda. And then through, through a series of analyses, I have attempted to articulate what imperatives will that policy reform, policy and legislative reform have for institutional restructuring within the country in terms of reconfiguring its role and stepping up, stepping up its capabilities. I have subsequently um, articulated a phase-wise uh, um, implementation agenda for phasing out that reform over a period of time where step one centers on uh, developing a national consensus on reform and increasing public financing, where step two talks about bracing the health information system, which is a discussion extremely relevant to the subject that you are focusing on today. Uh, step two also focuses on pulling a thread through existing evidence. Step three has a number of um, concrete recommendations with regard to strengthening institutions, honing norms, and mainstreaming technology. Step four is about prototyping alternative service delivery arrangements, and step five is about scale up for holistic reform. Uh, I hope that this modest con contribution um, would be relevant to other developing countries of Asia, um, particularly in terms of galvanizing the thought process towards reforming their health systems holistically. In my opinion, um, reform of health systems is absolutely critical to uh, mitigating some of the fundamental systemic problems that exist within health systems today. Uh, and these fundamental systemic constraints are critical to ensuring disease security, which is the subject that you have very admirably, uh, uh, that, uh, that you're very admirably focusing on today. Thank you for this opportunity and my apologies once again for not being able to be with you today. Take care.